month that started with uh, the international commemoration of the laborers of this globe also happens to be the Mental Health Awareness Month. That is particularly the month of May. But also we know that uh, the country was, uh, of course, shocked with uh, the death of the labor, the state, the labor minister of state, uh, the Honorable Engola, and of course our uh, our sincere condolences to the family and of course to the country at large. But today we shall try to draw uh, a correlation between uh, the state of unemployment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mental health status in this country. I think somewhere around last year you came across a report authored by New Vision, if you want to be specific, that indicated that 14 million Ugandans are in fact mentally ill. So these are very appalling statistics. So today we shall convene and discuss you know, the nitty gritties around mental health and also the status of unemployment at the same time. And to put all this in, into perspective is a panel of uh, eminent senior citizens of this country. That is now my honor to introduce to you this afternoon, and in no particular order, is a face you've seen on this show several times. Of course, for those who follow this show religiously, is retired Major Awish Pola, the Secretary for External Relations, Director, sorry, Director External Relations of the NRM Secretariat. Afande, thank you for making the time. Thank you so much. Maybe for clarity, Director for External Affairs, NRM Party. Because oh. you put it secretary, it's like I direct for me. <laughs> the for, for the entire party. So Thank I you. I have the mandate of matters of the party outside the jurisdiction of Uganda. Thank you very much for the clarity. Uh, next to myself is uh, Obalim Grace. Grace is a clinical psychologist and also an advisor at TPO Uganda. Grace, thank you for making the time. Thank you so much, Kudaga, and I'm glad to be here on the show. We are very glad to have you too. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the middle is Dr. Raymond Udaonyaro, who is a lecturer and psychiatrist at the Department of Psychiatry at the Macquarie University College of Health Sciences, and also the president of the Uganda Psychiatrist Association. Thank Mr. You. President. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah. We are very happy to have you as well. Uh, the last panelist on the show is uh, Barbara Kalumba, who is the Vice President of Uganda Counseling Association. Barbara, thank you for making the time to be here. Thank you. And mm. thank you for the opportunity as well. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Dovanero, I'll just uh, begin with you. <laughs> because of your title, you know, and uh, <laughs> obvious reasons, <laughs> is that uh, as we attempt to examine the state of uh, unemployment vis-a-vis -vis the current status of mental health, is that could you just shape for us a picture, give us the context of uh, this particular conversation? How do we find ourselves celebrating the Mental Health Awareness Month? Is it even important? So for that viewer who is a novice on this particular topic, what do you have to tell them? Thank you very much. I think that uh, to recognize mental health in this month of May is of monumental importance, uh, mostly because of the nature of mental health and mental illness. Being it that uh, they both derive from the brain. The brain is one of those really secretive organs of the body stored away in the skull where nobody can see it, nobody knows how it works. We just see the products of its work and usually it's elsewhere on the body. Now because of this creative nature of the brain and where it's kept, even its functioning is rather mysterious to us. Therefore when it breaks down, the illness is equally mysterious. Now, this mystery over the years has made people speculate on a lot of things. What causes it? How it starts? Is it the neighbor? Is it witchcraft? And all sorts of things. Is it curse from the gods? So over the years, more information has come to light, certainly. But this information is not available to everybody. The month of May is dedicated to demystifying mental health to everyone across the globe. We come here as specialists to play our part <coughs> in this demystification and would like to have a frank conversation with everybody and anybody 
regarding mental health. I think that mental health needs its day in the light mm -hmm. and the month of May is that day in the light for us. So we welcome all conversations regarding mental health and any queries and concerns from our viewers and the public at large. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Grace, uh, still uh, on the part of the context of this conversation is that to us who are not specialists in that uh, field of science is that we don't know how many categories of mental health there are. We know, for example, there is bipolar, we have heard about it, but just to understand this much more, what are the categories of mental health uh, breakdowns? Mm -hmm. But also, there is this syndrome, or, or, or there is this perception that you know, mental health is a white man you know, disease and things like that, and, and, and for us Africans, we, we should be immune to science. So I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, just demystify that kind of uh, you know, perception. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I want to start by uh, Dr. Raymond talked about mental health and mental illness, and he said both of them are a product of the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to start by putting there a little bit of highlight on that. Now, mental health, mental health is a state of normal function, is, is a state of uh, where you and me and everyone else, where you know your potential, you're able to understand you know what you can do and what you cannot do. And you cope with the daily life stressors. Stressors, when we say daily life stressors, we are talking about these issues that we face, death of a loved one, school fees demand, high rent, sickness, those are daily life stressors. Mm -hmm. And you're able to cope with it. And as you cope, you're functioning. You function normally, you meet your daily demand, you're productive, and you're contributing to yourself and even the people around you. Now, that is mental health. Then we have the other aspect that is called mental illness. Now, mental illness is the disease of mental health. This is how simple I normally put it. Mental health is your normal state. All of us, all of us panelists here, everyone else, mental health is what makes us function. We are able to tell that I can do this, I can't do that. We are able to know what our limits are when we are sick, we cope with stress, that is mental health. Now, when we say mental illness, we are talking about now the disease of mental health. Now, this, um, ranges of disease that affects your mental health. And I think this is what you're trying to ask, Kidega. There, there, there are quite a number of them. But just to bring a little bit of simplicity to them, we have them, they, they are into groups. We have what we call mood disorders. Mm -hmm. Mood disorders, these are the illness that affects a person's mood, the way you feel and the way you relate to people. Mm -hmm. And among it is what you mentioned, bipolar, bipolar mood disorder. Then still among mood disorder is what we have, uh, depression is also among it. And then uh, another group of illness that we have is what we call anxiety. Dr. Dohonyeru will bring on board that. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is also another form of mental illness. This is, you know, unfounded state of worry. You, th there's, there's no reason for you to be worried. You, but you, you're just constantly worried mm -hmm. that you're in anticipation. Something is going to happen or something mm -hmm. wrong is going to happen. And it's not a nice state to be in. You have high palpitation, you know, you're sweating, you, you're restless, you're not able to, to, to be settled. And then other than anxiety, we have what we call psychotic, psychotic disorders. Now, mm -hmm. this is the common one that people see everywhere. You can easily see this and you can tell. And this is where people now come it to say, when uh, they say that, in my language, they'll say, any lapoya, like the common language here, they'll say, oh, molalu, you know, a disclaimer. Now, when you look at it, they say, those are the people you call them, that these are mad. Because the psychotic disorders, these are disorders that makes a person lose his touch with reality. Mm -hmm. They're not able to relate and tell the difference between real and real, not real, good and not good. So these are the, the, you see my brothers and sisters who are out there on the streets, mm -hmm. either without clothes or eating mm -hmm. on the dustbin. Those are the ones that have what we call the psychotic disorders. And a, a typical example of it is schizophrenia. It's a mm -hmm. very common one. It comes with complete loss of reality, uh, touch with reality. Mm -hmm. A person hear voices, see physical things. When you find them talking to themselves in their world, it's real. They're communicating mm -hmm. to someone. But me and you look at them and say, no, that person is mad, is talking to themselves. But to them, me and you are the ones who are mad because we are not understanding their world. Mm -hmm. And then the other kind of mental illness that I also want to bring in is substance use. Yeah. Drugs, use of alcohol, mm -hmm. you know, smoking cigarette, 
even prescribed Marijuana. drugs. Mm-hmm. Yes, prescribed drugs. Yeah. Excessive use of Panadol's mm-hmm. painkillers. You want to live on painkillers. You don't sleep before you take painkillers. Mm-hmm. You know, smoking of marijuana, mm-hmm. chewing of mirror. Mm-hmm. All these, these are, these are the different categories of mental illness that we have now. Mm-hmm. Why do they say that mental health is a white man's thing? I, I like that people say that a lot and I'm happy for May. May is the month that allows us to come and demystify. It allows us mm. to come and say the facts, state the facts around mental health and mental illness in the most simple way possible. Now, if you look at presentation of mental health disorders or mental illness, mm. it comes in a manner that is very difficult to understand. Kidega, if I say that I have malaria, I go to the hospital, the doctor will draw my blood, take it to the lab, they test, and they will come and tell me you have mild or severe malaria. But when I have depression, which is a mental illness, I, would, I, w- I might be feeling isolated. I don't want to sit where people are. You see me crying, I might, you might not know why I cry. You see I don't want to talk to people. You will see that my interaction or productivity has changed. You start calling it as laziness. Now, understanding the way this sickness presents, one is why they say that, no, for us here in Africa, we don't have mental illness. That is for the whites, because it's the whites that can bring any sickness that is difficultly understandable to be able to explain clearly. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the presentation. In our forefathers, the way our, our, our culture, sometimes our cultural presentation. I, I, I come from the northern Uganda. And, 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 and we consult, I, I, you know, when they say that, you consult the gods, you go talk to them. Now, the way sometimes mental illness presents is similar to how we in the African setting, we take as a communication of our gods. When I was in high school, they told me about uh, when, how the gods communicate to people, making either a child sick in the family, so all this, so it comes and present now, people look at it and they're like, this for us, this is normal. But mm-hmm. then for the white people, this is a sickness. So that is just brief though, I want to say. Wow, thank you so much perspective in there. Mm-hmm. Retired Major, I, I was, I was uh, very attentively listening to uh, Grace here, and she mentioned uh, things like, um, at times the cause could be anxiety. You're worried about, you know, will I get a meal tomorrow? Your, you know, all these uh, school fees, things like that. And in your opening statements, you were very categorically clear uh, in the role that you play in the NRM. Now, with the current status of Uganda's economy, with the current living standards, with the prices of commodities being uh, fairly high, with, with, with Uganda's status generally, are Ugandans prone to mental health? If you look at our economy, you look at things like um, how, uh, uh, even you can talk about state brutality, the police, that we see, you know, handling people in, in really, uh, uh, in dignifying ways, aren't we prone to mental health? Well, thank you so much. and. I... I'm happy to, to be in this panel of experts. Uh, it's a very deep and specific science. Ideally, I'm a social scientist, but specifically, I'm a lawyer. So in legal training, we have very little but we, that I interface with in mental health. In any case, as a lawyer, I'm supposed to, to call expert opinion in that mm. area because mm. we know that lawyers wouldn't handle it so when i interface interface with it in my litigation either as a prosecution or as a defense counsel or even in a ordinary civil matters i call experts so my knowledge is limited for example in a a a bad mental health or a mad person, so to say, in literal sense, it acts as a defense in a, some civil cases. For example, if you were not in your right state of mind and you sell a land cruiser worth 200 million and you sell it 5 million, you can wake up the morning and say, no, 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 I was not in my state of mind. For example, if you had what you call temporary insanity with alcohol, Mm. The presumption there is that a contract is supposed to be 
a transaction between two consulting adults of sound mind. Mm. So if this one was selling a land cruiser of 200 of unsound mind, then why did you accept to buy? Some people also mistake that this may be a defense in criminal thing. It is not. Under criminal law, and that is why whoever is charged, you will pl pledge that I'm an adult of sound mind. Because the penalty of being insane is even worse. Why? Under the law, the minister, Minister of Internal Affairs, has the power to say what is called minister restriction. If the court finds you have committed an act which is wrong, but you are insane. So some people stay in losing up to 30 years under minister's order. So that's why some people will rather say, ah, I'm insane, so that I get my five years or seven years than saying you are actually insane. But many people think insanity is a defense in criminal law. It is not. So I'm just saying the interfaces that interfect. But I also want to comment about the origin of that state of mind. You know, of that state of mind. You see, philosophers are divided on consciousness. How does a human being come to be conscious? Some philosophers divide themselves and they are called idealists. And some people are called materialists because they believe, the materialists believe that we have the five senses. Is it five? Mm -hmm. The tongue, the nose, the mm -hmm. ear, the what? Mm -hmm. So all these senses interact with internal bodies. It is their reaction to internal bodies that absorbs these senses and it is processed in the brain. Now, once the brain is interfered with, then the sense of processing the material that you get outside is distorted. And of course, my friends have said clearly about what are the factors that affect the processing of this data that you either reflect with your teeth, I mean your tongue, with your eyes, with your ear, with your what? So uh, the many factors. Of course, substance consumption is one of them. And this can be even more instant. I know of a story of a boy who was seated with his father. But I just recently, some few minutes back, smoked drug, bang. So when he sat with the father, he took off, he ran and hit a wall. When he hit a wall, he came back and sat near the father and asked the father, Daddy, what were you running from? So in this state of mind, it was actually not him who ran and hit the wall. To him, it was the same father was seated with who actually ran. So you now see the state of mind under interference. So, so it is good to take cognition of the origin of consciousness and how things interfere with it and with a sub, uh, substance con uh, 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 hell, uh, substance consumption and mental health. Now, we have many man manifestations and people believe that many people are mad or insane for that case or mentally. The professionals prefer a more humane and polite way of calling it than the literal sense used on the street. Mental health and what, what and mental, whatever it is, but some people call it insanity. In law, it is more preferred as a state of insanity. Now, many of us actually have mental problems and it is manifesting in various ways and people don't see it. There was a time, I don't know when you went to Mulago, there was somebody who used to be in Mulago Hospital. He was insane, but his insanity just wanted him to mention names of countries. But he was smart. So the man wakes up in the morning, Russia, Poland, Brazil, Canada, <laughs> what? Kenya, Uganda. He goes back home. The following morning comes back with that. But dressing is okay, it's fine, it's smart. Mm -hmm. So you see that uh, we, there's various manifestations of mental, not being in a good mental health. Now, in your instant case of... Uh, the status of mental health and uh, the prevailing condition. I think it's already answered. In a way, it has effect. But I wouldn't like the answer to, to be overstressed by an emphasis like the current situation under NRM has made people mad. No. <laughs> this, 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 these are normal, challenging situations which exist in any, mm. even in any normal e e economy. Mm. What would I say? Normal? Well, take a normal economy like Sweden, for example. Mm. You still have many people mental challenges. Mm. They have lots of mental health uh, facilities. I, I, I happen to 
to work in the United Nations. I was a human rights judge in Switzerland for eight years. And therefore, my mandate was to see states' compliance to conventions. We are nine for the whole world. So we see it as a panel. Now, one of the clear provisions in almost every instrument is mental health. Health and mental health. Mm -hmm. Whether in convention on the rights of the child, whether in the social and economic, cultural rights, civil and political, nearly all these rights have element of health. And mental health is very important. So I took the chance almost to tour Europe and see they are, Switzerland is nearly a dream country. But you can be surprised by the mental health challenges in Switzerland. And they are kept in the institutions. So uh, it is true that these stress factors uh, exist. And it exists really. It is real. And of course, that is why as a party we come up with manifestos to address the various aspects of human life. But uh, it shouldn't be over stress like it's that, that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's a dream economy. Like Switzerland, which is a dream economy. It's a dream country. Literally, people don't die. People don't die because all my friends in the eight years who came and told me they had lost a father or a mother, it would be 104, 103, 105. Then one time somebody came crying that somebody, some American lady was teaching English, had died at 78 years. She had, was left with two years to make it. Mm. They cried that she had died a very young girl, <laughs> two years to make it. <laughs> but still, there are challenges of mental health. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Major. And perhaps I did not imply that, uh, that, <laughs> that perhaps the mental health condition here is... Uh, is attached entirely to the NRM regime. Only my, my point was that you know the prevailing circumstances do they yeah even ordinary stress need? factor yeah, yeah and, and thank you and I, like any ordinary stress factor thank you I'd move to Barbara Barbara there is an Abuja declaration I think of 2013 that mandates member states to allocate 15 percent of their budget to the health sector as someone who deals in guidance and counseling do you think that the support from the national coffers is sufficient to offer services that are not limited to guidance and counseling. Thank you. Uh, oh, of course, that's the that's mission that our national budget towards health has never gone beyond 7%. 7%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the so past, I think. I was actually going to say that when mm. now, now when you break down the, the budget that comes to the Ministry of Health, mm. but when you go down to the budget that is I'm allocated to mental health, health and, and neurological and substance abuse or neurological mm. disorders, you'll mm. be sad at what we're given. Because whatever is given is actually channeled to the referral hospital, which is Butabika Hospital, and it is never sufficient. Mm. So if you're talking about the 15% the that is supposed to be allocated to guidance and counseling, I think it's still a, a wish list for us to actually have it implemented or even see how it is going to happen. Because with all the stresses that we're struggling with as an economy and as a country and as person, people, we are not able to sustain our own selves or live alone, plan according to the budget that we have been allocated because they're never enough for us or for the services that we would want to offer. We are still in that <coughs> space where we're usually in that space where we have to switch or to choose. Are we going to put a personnel or are we going to put another drug or treatment that is probably better than a personnel? Yet we know that we need the two people or the two factors for the better improvement or for the better outcome of mental health. And because that has not been given priority at all levels, be it in the private and public settings or of practice, it still goes unanswered, or oh, still goes unanswered, still goes unfunded, and still goes, it's left to whoever can or may it afford to sustain or afford their treatment and care for mental health. Mm. But if we are to target to what was agreed and what was happening, I think we are far away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if all have to talk, and maybe the experts here. Mm -hmm. 
there's a joke, I don't know whether it is true, there's a joke that uh, about Butapika and the urge for resources. Mm. That one time President Museveni went there and as usual, as a government institution, they were crying for more funding. Mm. And the president asked them that, are you people doing work? He said, yeah, your excellency, we are doing work. He said, can you bring me a product of a mad person you have worked on? Mm. Then they brought a man, and then the president asked him, said, you man, I'm President Museveni, I'm the president of Uganda, do you know me? Then the man laughed, mm. and he said, you will be okay. Mm. Even me, when I came <laughs> here, I, I also <laughs> thought I was a great product. It's a great product. <laughs> <laughs> that even to me, when I came here. So the man is still thinking. <laughs> so Museveni said, what do you say? You work on them. Is this is what you have worked on. Mm. But if the man is, is still work. believing yes. that I'm a mad that man, is the work. Hmm? Yes. So maybe as a, we, 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 we crave for resources, I believe we have a public relations, but also action speaks louder than words. Mm. Maybe the policymakers, because they have not been victim themselves, they have not known the output from Butabika. We may have to see more, and the more we see, the more it attracts funding. And I think maybe if I could add something, yeah. it's it's why we celebrate the month of May because then we're able to change the narrative. Mm. The narrative around mental health, like Dr. Raymond and Grace have said, has always had a negative impact to it. Mm. So when it is mental health, it is stuck to Tavika Hospital mm -hmm. and it is stuck to psychosis. Mm. So until the person is manifesting in the psychotic disorders, then all these other manifests of mm -hmm. mental health challenges are regarded as temporal or non-essential. Non mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, uh, you, you will be fine, you know. And then until someone flips and then gets into a psychotic feet or mm -hmm. display, that's when people wake up. And that is the challenge we have had. Mm. Even when it comes to funding. Every yeah. time we ask for funding, someone thinks we are tagging only the psychotic disorders, yeah. mm. which are also not even well-funded or sustained when it comes to treatment, their, their prescriptions and everything. Because mm. we, when we're looking at prescription of drugs, for example, it is just not for the referral hospital. This is treatment that should be accessed right from yeah. the health center too. Yes. To health center three, to health center four, until we get to the the regional referral hospitals, then to Butabika. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that channel going. Yeah. We don't have that channel going down for mental health practitioners. We don't have that channel going down for mental health treatment care. Yeah. So okay. even when we're advocating for funding, it mm -hmm. is not tagged to the to the one referral point, which is Butabika. It should be going down from health center two where a, a common Ugandan should be able to go and say, this is what I'm going through, and get the best Absolutely. treatment, mm -hmm. get the best service, mm -hmm. so that we are able to address the mental health challenges in the statuses that we have mentioned them mm -hmm. until we refer them to the experts. Yeah. But because of the priority, like <coughs> the retired media is saying, until it hits home, yeah. that's when people wake up and say, oh, now what can I do? And yeah. you see, what you, what you want to do when it has hit you it's still personal, it's still individualizing the intervention, mm. yeah. yet we are actually advocating for a national intervention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, just, mm. just to add a bit, like what she said in regards to the services, there was a report that came out from the Health Committee in 2018. It, 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 it said that um, there's 85% gap in regards to mental health services. Yeah. Ugandans who need to access mental health services, <coughs> there's 85% gap. Meaning that report was saying that only 15% yeah. of Ugandans who are yearning and are looking to get the mental health services are able to get it. The 85% gap is because of what Barbara has been explaining. Yeah. There is this very beautiful structure. You know, in, uh, was it 1999? That's when they introduced yeah. mental health mm -hmm. into the general yeah. primary health care. Yeah. And Uganda the said that, yes, centralized, mm -hmm. let us structure it to be within the primary health care structure. Mm -hmm. So we put it to be implemented from the health center, center to coming two. up, mm -hmm. not just to be at a level of national referral hospital. But then you find that not only looking at personnel alone, sometimes I went to Gulu referral hospital I, I give a plus to, 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 to Gulu Regional Referral Hospital, the Department of Mental Health. They really do their best. I, 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 I had challenges with a friend and I needed them to get up. And I went there. It was heartbreaking that there was one psychiatrist who was there. And that day he had traveled 
and we were waiting for him to come back to come and review patients the following day mm. and i found over like 18 people waiting to be reviewed by the psychiatrist who had gone and then the psychiatric clinic officer who is attached by an ngo had not yet arrived because his motorbike broke down mm. and was yet to come but you know i found these psychiatric nurses that were there and the manner at which they were supporting mm. these patients i was i was i was impressed <coughs> but you look at this lack of of, of, of services lack of personnel to be able to meet this. Mm. The retired major said that, uh, the president said, give me your product. Mm. Uh, doctor murmured, but he didn't brought it <laughs> out. The fact that that particular gentleman was able to tell that when I came, I used to think I was the president, and but now I, I know I'm not. <laughs> That's already product. product. That yeah. is already an outcome. That yeah. is already the intervention. the intervention that has been done. One thing that we really need to know is that uh, seeing something out of when you invest into mental health takes time. Yeah. And you will not see it very clearly spelled out on the board. Yeah. But you're going to see it in the way people react. You're going to see it in increased productivity. Mm -hmm. You're going to see it in reduction in corruption. Yeah. You're going to see it in uh, better relations between uh, security personnel mm -hmm. and, and the community. You're mm -hmm. going to see a reduction in demonstrations and strike. Domestic violence. You're going to see a reduction in domestic violence. You're going to see a reduction in gender-based violence. You're going to see a reduction in drug use among students. You're going to see a reduction in accidents, accidents yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, you, there was a time it was a trend of school fires mm. yeah. until when Boarding. Uganda yes mm. Uganda Counseling Association took it upon themselves and started mm. moving to schools mm. and started doing awareness around mental health of children yeah. and the school fire reduced so when we invest into mental health the product is seen in the broader life spectrum of a human being mm. and of a person yeah. and all this violence that we are seeing between you know when we called it an um, I, I call it too much energy. Ugandans, we have too much energy. <laughs> you know, even something that you just need to see a demonstration and you just walk with your shield, just, just walk with them, let them go if they want to go to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, put your shield around them so that when they walk with them, let mm. them go. But because we have so much energy, you know, and we want to bring it out. Mm. We seem to be having too much... But, but I think that, that goes back to what I think what one of us mentioned here, mm -hmm. is that even those police officers, mm -hmm. as they're performing that duty, are they in the right mental status? Because back at home, probably they are being suffocated with so many needs. They, they, their kids need tuition, they, yeah. they haven't done. So they come to their workplace when they are already, you know, sort of in that mental state of, ah, mm. you know what? So I, I think also that violence, like you said, could be as a product of the unsaid... Um, you know, stresses, stresses and, that they are and, going and through. Like they, could be, they could be unsaid, but they could also be unassessed. Unassessed. Mm. Because if, if I can't say it, because I don't know how to say it, mm. then within my workspace, there should be someone who is able who to Who knows assess. it, exactly. Mm. Yes. Or I, within I, your circle. Or mm. within my circle. Mm -hmm. Because now, now, for some of us who have got a chance to work in different workspaces, mm -hmm. we have been exposed to good and not very good workspaces. Mm. The workspaces you go in and someone is intentional mm. of, about you. They want to know your name. Someone will say, good morning, Grace. Mm. How are you? Today you're not wearing your red lipstick. That means that person has special interest in that person. Mm. And then that person is going to get an attachment to Grace or to Raymond because mm. now they get to know a little bit more of them. Mm. And when they're not wearing their tie or when they're not wearing their blue or when they are not having their hair in a mm. path, they are quick to notice. Yeah. Is everything fine? Mm -hmm. How is home? How mm -hmm. did you sleep? Mm -hmm. And at that moment, they can catch and say, Grace is having a bad day. Yes. Probably we don't channel all those clients there. Mm -hmm. Probably we don't, it's not the right time for her to have a meeting yeah. to defend, you know, budget allocations but, but, and what, but, like but, that. But, 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 and Barbara, that's a very good point. But you see, with all this capitalism, who even cares? Because your boss is looking out to make the most profit. Exactly. So whether your mental health is breaking down, all they want is to take the most advantage of your work rate, use it as much as possible. To them it is... And that's what business. we're saying. That's exactly what, is what we're want. saying. Because it, it is, is us who have allowed to, to move into that capitalism. Mm. We have. We have switched, we have allowed to prioritize results over 
person o- over the process of getting those results. Mm. What I want is I want a score of a hundred percent. So if you, I don't care how you get it, mm. and because you've told me you want a score of a hundred percent, I am mm. not firm enough to come and say, you know what, Doctor mm. Raymond, mm. I can't do a hundred percent. We all get into that shell of he said a hundred, mm. we we'll do it at what at cost? What cost? Yeah. And every time you keep giving me a hundred, I'm not going to think at what cost are you getting it mm. because you have not come back to me as a boss to tell me, by the way. The cost of us giving you that 100, eh? it is an arm and a leg for us. Mm. Then we have the dialogue. We have a generation that cannot speak out. We have a generation that cannot be assertive. You know, there is a mix between being assertive and aggressive. Mm. But we need. We, I think we need to have people who can be assertive. We need people who can be affirmed. I thought, and, I thought this generation is Generation X. And, <laughs> you know, with all this social media, they are so free-minded, they are so... Did you hear you know, her word? Assertiveness <laughs> and aggressiveness. <laughs> I, I, I really liked Barbara's choice of word. Distinction. Yeah. Yes, she actually yes. said we have a generation that is not assertive. And I agree with her. Mm, but they're mm. aggressive. Our generation is very aggressive. Mm. They see something, before we internalize it, we have already, we have already, on rushed, we have already made judgments. Judgments. we have already mm. made judgment, we have already, mm. you know, taken a decision and acted on what we need to do. But an assertive generation is a generation that looks at issues, mm. internalize it, mm. sees the impact not only within them, but the external yeah. environment, and then presents it. Mm. Makes makes their case known, makes a presentation, but not aggressively mm. put it out there. Okay, so it's how I, I to like bring, how to bring in <laughs> doctor. doctor. Yes, doctor yes. has been quiet for a while. Doctor, yes, sir. of course I'll give you a chance to make your comments. But mm. could you shed first a picture because I'm trying to look at, for example, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm-hmm. that kind of a mm. pyramid. Mm. Mm. So the the mental health stages. As you as you as you digress or as you as you get worse, so mm. uh, what is the starting point, okay. and what are the signs and symptoms that someone should look out for? That oh, if you're feeling this way, then I think I'm now at this stage. Then if you feel this way, then you're now advancing towards you know the red line. So right, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you for bringing that mm. because yeah, I've been itching to to go all the way back to that beginning. Mm. But I think it would be a disservice if I didn't just make one or two comments Mm. on what's been raised earlier. I think that for me, the month of May is a wonderful month. Mm -hmm. It's a month that helps to remind us not to trivialize mental health. Every time I listen to non-mental health personnel talk about mental health, Mm. (coughs) and this is not to throw any jabs at Major here, but references are made to jokes Mm. And you know, every time we make something a joke, then it's only 50% serious. Mental health is no joke. Certainly mental illness is even a graver issue. Mm. Now, if I were there on the day that the president came, if he did come, one of the things that I would have commented on would have been the idea that you cannot quantitatively measure a qualitative issue. How, what percentage do you put on the quality of sleep somebody gets who hasn't slept for a month? What number do you put on a family that has had a patient screaming in the other room for the last two weeks and they have had to have it locked and then that patient stops screaming and actually starts to listen? So how we see improvement in mental health is different from how the general public sees it. And would like the general public to start to become aware of these changes. To start to become aware that these improvements that we, they seek from us practitioners, when we send the patient back, one of our biggest challenges is that you bring us broken people. We mend them, but we send them back to the same environment that it's broke broken. them down. Mm-hmm. And you break them down once more and send them back to us claiming our treatment didn't Didn't work. work. Now, if we cannot adjust that environment, and the environment includes even just the words we say to the mentally ill person. We call them expressed emotions. Some people are so aggressive with them. Some people demean them. For example, when someone has come back from Butabika, he's been admitted for a month, comes back in the home, and we are having a family discussion, 
Mm. And he said, ah, no, Barbara, for you, you keep quiet. It's okay. That says a lot. Or there is work to be done and you say, no, Grace, for you, you sit. Don't worry. Uh, that isolation. Uh, that exclusion there treatment. Mm. becomes a consequence of what her having say, had mental We are illness. giving you three days before you see you back to your bottles. Absolutely. So that's not helpful at all. That's an environment that undoes the work we have done. Mm. Second thing I wanted to make a comment on is that as a nation, we are reactive. I don't know how many times I've got phone calls from very big people in this country when somebody has jumped off a building or there's been a fire in a school or some other tragedy that involves a distressed human being. Dr. Raymond, what is UPA doing about <laughs> mental health in this country? <laughs> My answer has always been standard. The same thing we have been doing for the last 50 years. Yes. <laughs> it's just you don't notice. People want tragedy. People want drama so that they can pay attention. Yeah. And we are not mm. seeking drama. We are not seeking glory. Mm. So we are not telling you every day. But what we want people to know is that even when somebody doesn't jump off a building, Agreed. somebody else is thinking about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, research says 20% of people in the general population are thinking about suicide. suicide yes. So it's that pervasive. Mm -hmm. And then to your comment, um, I, first, I don't see a contradiction mm -hmm. with the, your comment on capitalism. Mm -hmm. I don't see a contradiction between capitalism and mental health. In fact, I think capitalism should entirely embrace mental health. Because when the employees are mentally healthy, the productivity grows up. In this country, we are too busy trying to appear busy. But what are we really doing? There is this, you know, rush to go nowhere. Everybody in Kampala seems so busy. And half the time we are absent-minded about what we are doing. So a border, border is scratching a car, a car is knocking a person, and, and all this is happen, playing out in this city. Because we want to convince the capitalist that we are good for it. The better way to convince the capitalist that we are good for it, give us mental health days, give us mental health breaks, give us our leaves without having to call me and tell me to go with the company phone on leave. Then when I come back refreshed from my village in Layoko there, I'll come back and deliver. Where is Layoko? Layoko is in Omoro, oh. in, uh, near the late Olanya's, uh, speaker Olanya's home. So... Border areas, I come from Patong. Yeah, you come from Patong? Uh -huh. Yeah, border, that uh, dimension. That area of Odeaki, yeah. Mm. So th th there's no contradiction at all. Now, just coming back to, you know, the, the whole concept of mental health and what it is and how it plays out, where it starts. Yeah, Let stages. me just say, let's forget about stages. Because when we stage things, we get it wrong. Mm. Mm. Because then we become rigid about the boundaries. Oh, goes, yes. You belong here. Mm. You, you belong here. here yes. mm. That's not mental health. But then if you know where you belong, then you can subscribe for your no. the proper treatment. Let me help you. If you don't know the Let me help you. <laughs> Let me help situate you. Mm. So what mental health is, is that it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. It's a continuum. Mm -hmm. From the moment of your birth mm -hmm. to the moment that you will die, mm -hmm. you will be running up and yeah, down, down the continuum of mental health. Mental health, I say. Mm -hmm. Because within mental health, mental health is a big branch of medicine, just like social health and physical health. Mm -hmm. They are big branches of medicine. Now, within mental health, you have people who have optimal ma mental health. Mm. These are the newborn babies mm. who have not yet experienced pain, loss. Eh, they, they are here at the green end. Mm. As you move down that continuum, the green starts changing to yellow, to brown, to red, to very, very red, where there is mental illness. Mm. Mm. Now, us, the general population in Uganda, we are swinging up and down that continuum. And I can say anybody above the age of 20 in Uganda
does no, no longer crosses to the lower half. Lower. <laughs> <laughs> we are swimming between halfway to, to, to the mental illness end. <laughs> so if you want to stage yourself, yeah. ask yourself, where am I in people. terms of my own health mm. and my function? Mm. And you realize that even within a single day, you will go all the way to the extreme where you are just one tragedy away from, one trigger away. Mm. from breaking down to going all the way back to laughing with your workmate. So we keep swinging up and down that. Mm. So mental health is not a static thing. Mm. It's a dynamic thing. Mm. It's a fluid concept. Mm. So sometimes, even within a given week, two days of it, I feel I'm, I have optimal mental health. And then you pack me up with a lot of work. Then I feel I'm on this end. Mm. I am stressed out. I can't sleep. My appetite goes. All these are forms of mental health. Mm. The ones that eventually come to seek help are those who can no longer function. If you tip off this scale, then we say that you have, that, you have a mental disorder. And I want to make also the viewers understand that the, there's a distinction between a mental disorder mm. and mental illness. Mm. So the newspaper article that scandalized Ugandans last year, about 14 million. I, I, I was amused. <laughs> and I got text messages asking, is it true? Is Could it I true? be one of the 14? <laughs> the MPs asked me that when yeah. I went to train them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I can also be dramatic sometimes. Yeah. It is a total underestimate. Mm. If we are talking about <laughs> mental illness, illness, it's a total, total under absolute underestimate. Very small. <laughs> <laughs> because what it is, is that mental illness is how you feel. Mm. You, 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 the one who feels it. Mm. Now, she's just told you, Barbara told you, some people don't know how to communicate it. We feel it. We don't know how to communicate it. Mental disorder is what you get after you've visited Grace mm. or Raymond here. Mm. After we've told you using yes. very strict criteria, yes. say, okay, this is depression. Yes. Those <laughs> things you are feeling. Mm. That illness you're feeling it's is called. depression. Mm. That's disorder. But illness, all of us are ill. And I told you, even in one given day, you border illness, you come back to normality, you go to illness. And it is for all conditions, not just mental illness. Even mm. pressure. If I were to measure your blood pressure early in the morning when you've just woken up, you're going to be a textbook case of a normal blood pressure. Okay, towards lunchtime, mm -hmm. you're now hungry, <coughs> the boss has chewed you out a little bit, mm -hmm. now you have 140. Mm -hmm. You almost seem sick. Mm. And then maybe later in the evening when you've met out with your friends and you've poured out your heart, then it comes back down. So it's the same for mm. mental health. Yeah. So we're moving oh. up yeah. and down oh. that spectrum. Yeah. Mm. The early symptoms you should look out for is whether you are still performing. Mm -hmm like the Kidega of yesterday. Mm. How are you rating yourself? Because if you cannot identify it, and we say, know thyself, mm. that's where it should start. People should know themselves to the extent that you know what you're feeling and what that feeling means. You know what you're thinking and what that thought means. You should know how your sleep patterns usually are. And once there are changes, you should ask why. What is going on? You should know how your appetite usually is. And when that changes, what's going on? So those vegetative symptoms, what mm. we call vegetative symptoms, they are the ones that start to change fast when anybody's in distress. Mm. The appetite, the sleep, the, 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 even the sense of enjoyment. Mm. You may even do the things you were doing, but you no longer feel that you love it, that you're enjoying. Maybe you used to like to watch football. Mm. And now you just go and stare at the screen. Mm. Whether Arsenal scores or not, it's irrelevant to you. But you're there participating. So if people start to monitor themselves, look at themselves first, and that's what May is about. We want people to pay attention to their yes. own mental health. I like the UNICEF uh, mantra that, you know, if you want to cause change, mm. it must start, start at the really. doorstep, mm. at your doorstep. Now, we cannot change Uganda, but if each Ugandan started to pay attention to their mental health, we would go such a long way. All 50 million of us, we would call this country now 
a mentally healthy country. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Very, so much knowledge right there. Retired Major, I have to speak to you as a duty bearer. And you've said here before that you have a social contract with Ugandans. And part of your obligation in this contract is you owe Ugandans at least the bare minimum of uh, uh, access to medical health or even a good, healthy uh, environment. So let's just evaluate, for example, the legal framework. Uh, the, you look at the Employment Act of 2005, I'm not so sure. Does it, does it allow an employee that sufficient room to maybe take work leave? Mm -hmm. Or that, does it allow you to work in a conducive environment? That is one. Two, is that do you think as a government you've done what is sufficient? Not, not what is, uh, what is uh, uh, perhaps maybe optimum, but what is sufficient mm -hmm. to allow, you know, Ugandans to not be able to tip over that, that point. Because I know that every district has, for example, a district level officer. Mm -hmm. Do we have district uh, mental, uh, I, I don't know, but district health officer. Uh, so just, just, yeah, 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 just break it down for, for us and mm -hmm. what government is doing exactly to intervene on aspect of mental illness? Well, it's a, a broad policy and legislative area. So I hope I may be able to put a few things together. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, suffice to say, I like to agree with what doctor says, mm -hmm. and especially on the qualitative assessment as opposed to the quantitative. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, that is why the president, instead of asking how many people mm. have you put right, mm. he asked for one. How does he feel now? Mm. How does that one feel? To me, that was the nearest he could go to a qualitative as opposed to quantitative. Mm -hmm. If he was to use quantitative assessment, he would have possibly ask this year, how many have you released out? Mm. How many did you receive and how many did you pass out? Or every month, what is the rate of turnover? How many do you receive? How many do you? So to me, that would be the quantity. But by asking how one feels now, to me, is nearest to qualitative approach. Now, the policy framework is that uh, government tries in its way. Uh, first of all, you have the ministry, which covers it which is a line minister, who unfortunately was the one who was shot recently. Mm. So I was with him on, uh, was with him on that mm. very Monday. I last communicated to him at two minutes past six. Oh, because uh, about a few months back, he was going to Geneva. Mm. And he asked me that he didn't know people in Geneva, so he wanted contact for people he can be with. So I gave him. <coughs> So he went and they stayed well, they had dinners, they had everything. So Monday in Namutum, I told him, because he came where I was sitting, mm -hmm. I told him, you know what, I'm going to, to Geneva, to Europe, I'll meet uh, your colleagues in Denmark on Tuesday. Tuesday. So he says, no, 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 those guys kept me so well. Please, please, ask, there were three, ask for their names. And I want their names because I want to make them a particular package. Mm. as a gift for thanking them for keeping me. I said, fine. They even ordered, this was Tim who was shot, mm. told mm. Tim, please take Major's number by Saturday. We must have made all our package. So I asked, I sent a WhatsApp to Geneva, they replied, let's mm. forward to him. Mm. Two minutes past six, and he never read it. He didn't take blue. Mm. So meaning he didn't, I, I imagine he was going to read the following morning, mm. but because he wanted the name, so. Mm. So that is a line minister. Uh, who was in charge level. So, if you start at the ministry level, then you come down to the commissioner in charge level and all that. So the structural framework is there. But in legislation, there's a very elaborate uh, labor law. From employment to termination, mm -hmm. from entrance to exit, plus proper uh, termination procedures, or exit procedures. So, uh, and the condition of service. Mm. They set up our required condition of service, nearly every employment area, government or civil, government or non-government, mm. 
including the army. Mm -hmm. So the legislation framework is there. And also there are other auxiliary, so to say, support system, like association of trades. Various trades are in their way, including lawyers, including mm -hmm. doctors, including artisans and everybody else. So this is also provided under the law that you should form your trades, be in your group, discuss your problems, see how to handle things. So in a structural formation, both institutional and legal framework, mm -hmm. there's, a, uh, there's all that is sufficient. And in any case, even if it is sufficient, not sufficient, in bills there, there are procedures to make amendments and make better improvements. Well, thank you very much. I, we are due for a short commercial break, but there is so much knowledge being dispensed on this show this afternoon. And to the viewer out there, just get yourself, I don't know, a bottle of water, a cup of tea, and just process this. But above all, be introspective about your mental health. Have an in-depth analysis of your own mental health status. That is what this month is about. And see you shortly after this. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Uh, we'll be back from that short commercial break and we shall just continue from where we stopped. And uh, Barbara, let me just uh, begin with you. The dynamics around access to uh, counseling services. Let me try to uh, break it down in this way that I, am, I, I don't know if a high-profile individual, for example, a cabinet minister in this country, would comfortably walk into a guidance uh, and counseling facility to access uh, counseling services. So in your day-to-day -day work, how comfortable are people with, uh, first and foremost, acknowledging that they have a mental issue and they need help? Is it, does it come easy for someone to acknowledge that all people first try to hide, they try to, you know, you know, keep it private a bit until it gets to a point where they now cannot hide it anymore, then they're forced to now walk into the counseling services. Uh, you're using very strong words, forced mm. into. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hide anymore. Mm. But mm. how accessible are the counseling services in the country? Probably I would start there. They, the services are readily accessible. Mm. I think it would be affordability. They could be accessible, but are they affordable? Mm -hmm. Because a session with a professional counselor, and, and now that's where we're also having a dynamic, because everyone who has done a, a two days training, a week's training, has a certificate and says, I'm a counselor, please come and, and share with me your mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't, they're not equipped to handle the, the magnitude that comes with that. Mm. So what the association does, the Uganda Counseling Association, is we have, we, we let me say it's a group of registered professional mm. counselors mm. and psychologists mm. that have gone through proper training from diplomas to bachelors to masters to PhDs mm. on how to help people with their normal stresses. Mm. So accessibility of professional help is available it can be accessed. Mm. Affordability is the question. And that is when we go back to our... No, just, Barbara, just to stick with you on that point, is that, for example, let me put you a question. Would you mm. elect an MP 
who, for example, is perceived to have a major issue. Yes, we have had, we've had, we've had, we've had, we've like had high profiles callers. We have yeah. elected them. <laughs> we have Not elected would you, them. we have elected, elected them. them. They are there in parliament. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, calling no. us for support. <laughs> because the point I'm trying to get to is that I don't know how many high profile people need help. No, how come many high hope. profile people come for hope? It is how they come how? that is an issue. Most come. of them will just make a quiet call. Yes. Like, could you pass by but the, I think you know, the majority also get referrals. Mm. But referrals when another not, professional is not, is access. Many of them are not access. Not in the way you're saying. Many, it. many, I think, are afraid of being seen by the public no, to no, have no, no, a no, no, mental. No, 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 no. I think it's. I, now I think that is that could be a personal perception. I wouldn't mm. want to generalize it okay. because I have also interacted with people who come out and say, mm. I, need "I need help, and this is how I need mm. it." And it it is not even it is not protocol barring at yeah. all. Mm. They will call and say, "Am I talking to this person? Mm. I've been told you're going to help me. How do you want me to work with you? Mm. And or how can we work together?" And there is no protocol. There is no society social stigma, stigma. or anything. Nothing. Mm. So I think it is it could be a one on one. Mm. where other people will think, how will I be seen? There are those that do not care. Mm. I mean, if I need help, I am a human being like you. I need help. And mm. I, if you are the person to give me the help, I will come and get it. Mm. So that that shouldn't be tagged to if people are high profile, then how are they accessing care? Mm. Mm. We have implementing partners that have tell free that have tell free counseling sessions mm. and people call in and they will say my name is Raymond. Mm. When Raymond says my name is Raymond, you're going to be thinking, mm. so you is are the, the major doctor. The doctor. <laughs> so you're interacting with Raymond and giving mm. support mm. without even knowing what kind of status they mm. are in mm. this country. Mm. And that is also another way of seeking support. However, mm. there are those that have come to us and said, this is the help I need. Yeah. Can I come to you or do you want to come to me? Mm. Whichever works mm. is what we shall use. Mm. So I wouldn't want to say that high profile people don't seek help. They mm. actually do seek help. Depends on how they, they get the help. Do. But they do get the help. Because the other thing is, as well as the, the high profile people are able to seek help and afford help, mm. how about those that need the help and can't, can't afford it? it. Yeah. <clears throat> that is why I was going to the that. Access. Um, mm -hmm. That accessibility is available. However, affordability. Mm -hmm. Because if if uh, if you to do a session, if you to do a a session, should be forty five minutes mm -hmm. to an hour, mm -hmm. plus or minus. If you to do a professional session with a professional psychologist, mm -hmm. it was it's going to cost you one hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do a, a professional a session, yes. Mm -hmm. Why if, don't you reduce it? <laughs> <laughs> so who That's sets that standard? Who, who sets that standard? Mm. The association sets the, the association. standard mm. because we are we are we have registered members who have mm. their qualifications. They mm. have gone to school yeah. mm. and they have to put a price to their mm. cost of education. Mm. Right. So we wouldn't want to just, you know, throw it around pro as bono. anything. Mm. We we have sessions where we do pro bono. Mm. Like you know that when you're going to see if you're going to see Dr. Raymond, for example, mm. you will not go with 20,000. Mm. He's a senior consultant. Mm. Mm. And the trick we are having here is when people talk about social sciences, they think we can we can negotiate. Mm. When it goes to physical science, mm. it is then dead. They, mm. Why? It is still science. Yeah. The art of speaking, the art of, of counseling, the mm. art of treatment, yeah. everything else. It's a science yeah. around mm. it. Mm -hmm. So when we get in that aspect of this is an art and this is a science, or this is a social science, it should be less scaled to a physical science. Then, yeah. But back to the cost. So if you're going to see a professional counselor, it's going to be 100,000. Mm. If you're going to see a, a, a para counselor, it mm. would be 70,000 mm. or 50, 50 to 70,000. But how many Ugandans can afford 50,000 per session? Good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is why when we're advocating for funding, mm -hmm. we're not just advocating for funding just for the treatment mm -hmm. arm of it of mm -hmm. prescrip prescribed drugs mm -hmm. or regimens. We're also advocating for funding to the personnel part of it. Because if we have all these graduates that are leaving universities and are deployed, right, Actually, to the was, health centers, health centers two, health centers three, mm -hmm. health centers four, and these are, these are public servants. 
So mm. they are able to start to assess the issues and address those issues right from grassroots. By the time that person, by the time that Barbara client is coming through the hierarchy to get into Dr. Raymond's desk mm. office, mm. they have really had interventions. And now we have ticked all the boxes and until he gets there. Yes, the be, challenge yeah. comes in here that because people believe the narrative that we're trying to run away from, that because people believe mental health, it is a purely psychotic issue, mm. everyone is going to flood Dr. Raymond's office yeah. and stress him out. And yet he will, he, he has the, <laughs> the liberty to say, Grace, mm. I need to refer this one. Yeah. That's not me. Barbara, I need to yeah. refer this one. Yeah. But also the, the, the challenge we are having is changing the mindset of Ugandans to know mm. that this is protocol. When I go to a hospital, I'll see a nurse who is going to triage me. Yeah. I'll go to a lab. Mm. And after that, I'll be referred to the to doctor, doctor for prescription. Mm. Once the general doctor has not been able to address my needs, they're mm. going to refer me to a physician, mm. to a an ENT, mm. to an ops and guide or something. Mm. And that is, that is the same arrangement in mental health. Mm. The challenge is Ugandans perceive or presume that they actually understand mental health more than the practitioner does. <laughs> so while you're trying to channel them yeah. into the right way it should be handled, they want to get prescribed medicine yeah. before they actually go through. And by, by the time they go down, they're thinking, so why did I start here? Yeah. And you can't, you're very exactly. polite to yeah. say, we had told you, but you refused. We cannot say that. So they're mm. like, no, it's okay, we shall handle it. Mm. So mm. affordability is the question. The Access business. is there. We mm. have graduates from graduates from degree level since 2007, mm. where are they? Mm. Makari University runs a master's in counseling. Psychology mm. runs a master's in clinical mm. psychology. Where do these people go? Mm -hmm. We have over 15 graduates of PhDs mm. in mm. both clinical and counseling, counseling. supervision mm. and education. Where are they? Mm. Uh, just, just Grace, I want to yes. explore that part with you. And mm -hmm. uh, just, I think a week ago, all we saw so medical interns mm -hmm. uh, striking, striking. And, mm -hmm. and, and asking mm -hmm. to be deployed. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that with these insufficiencies that that, uh, well, that Barbara talks right about, mm -hmm. I, I, I would imagine that government would be quick to in fact deploy this um, interns, interns yeah. mm -hmm. to support the medical center. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, where is the missing link? But also speak about the support that the interns perhaps have to offer, offer. to the health sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I'm actually glad that uh, you, you, you brought that up. I want to share a personal experience. I, 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 I do, I'm very keen when it comes to my health mm. and the health of my family. So I, I'm one of those Ugandans who just walk into the, the hospital and say, I want to do a general medical checkup. Mm -hmm. I have no sickness. I've been okay. And I carry everybody. And like, you know, we are going to do a general medical checkup. And we mm -hmm. just, I just do it. I just want to know that, mm -hmm. you know, Everything is okay. Everything is fine. Mm. So I, I walked into one of the hospitals. I will not mention names. Mm. Uh, I have a nephew. He's a doctor. So I went in to see him about three, three, four months ago. And I walked in there and services were doing very well. Things were moving quick. He's, uh, and he's like, you know, we have intern doctors that are helping. Mm. And then I walked into that same place about one week ago. Mm. And I found a flood of patients. Flood of clients waiting. And I asked my nephew, I'm like, okay, so what is going on? Mm. And he's like, we don't have interns and the mm. intern doctors are on strike. And you, we are having interns who are saying, we have not been deployed. We need to be deployed. And um, I was having a chick chat. I like chatting with people and, and picking funny, funny. I told one of my friends, I'm like, uh, our country, we have... Um, I really want to be very nice. I want to be very emotionally, very sensitive right now. We have, uh, we have uh, fellow Ugandans who are holding office, who, who I want to say that uh, they lack a lot of uh, emotional intelligence and a mm. lot of, uh, they're really not empathetic. You empathy. know, empathy is a very mm. beautiful thing. Mm. Okay, let me say empathy. Mm. When you're empathetic, you, you, you put yourself into the shoes of that person and you imagine mm. if it's really my old mother who is about 86, who is there in that hospital and they cannot get help mm. because doctors are few, how would I feel? But unfortunately, uh, we have leaders who are not empathetic. Mm. They really don't have empathy. 
they, 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 they just maybe sympathy, but they're not, and I don't deal so much with sympathy. Because sympathy mm. is like, all right, so sorry, mm. but it's, sorry. you know, yeah. it's your fault. Mm. It's, it's, it's your issues. Deal with it. In, 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 in my village there, they like saying that neighbor's problem cannot stop me from sleeping. Mm. That is sympathy. But empathy, you tell yourself that when my neighbor's dog is barking, they're not sleeping, I won't sleep. So if we had, I was telling this person, I said, we have leaders who don't have empathy. And I was making this reference in regards to the intern strike mm. and the ongoing um, exhibition, the health issues mm. exhibition that is mm. ongoing mm. and the level at which first there's no response mm. uh, and, and even the response that are there is so reluctant. It's a mm. very, you know, very reluctant response and, and it's like, okay, they will strike, they will talk, they will tweet, they will all spaces and then they will keep quiet mm. and they won't do anything. But people need the services. Yeah. My question would be, maybe me and uh, my senior could discuss it. What is it that is holding these respective ministries from doing the deployment that is needed? Should, are we safe to sit here and tell Dr. Raymond that uh, maybe me and him need to start doing outreaches into these respective ministries mm. to just do assessment? Maybe we are here thinking they don't have empathy mm. when there is really... They, they, they are having illness that we need mm. to give them diagnosis <laughs> and start saying this ministry has mm. this number of disorders mm. in, in them, okay? Mm. So looking at that, I think um, back to, to, to what Barbara was saying and what uh, our senior was saying. Legislation structures that we have in, in, in place, she said since 2007. I registered with the Uganda Counseling Association in, uh, in 2012 when I was in my second year of my degree in, in, in counseling, because I did a degree in counseling mm. and then a master's in clinical psychology. That's when I registered with them in 2012. So I'm imagining over the time up to now, they're having a big, a big pool of professionals that are there. People used to cry a lot. Psychiatrists are very few. Mm. We have the president. He can tell you, are you less than 100? 60. You, 60. You're 60. Mm. Now, looking at the money For the whole country. For 50 for the million country, people. For 50 million people. <laughs> and I'm counting retired 60. psychiatrists too. <laughs> included. Mm. Like my senior mentors, the professor. Yes, Moses, is all, all of them are in the 60. Now, if you look at the management of mental health issues, the way Barbara explained if we are to understand it critically and look at, we used to, we, we, we pick the understanding of, the self-understanding of how we feel and how things mm. are affecting us. Mm. I say it with all firmness that the 60 psychiatrist is enough. Mm. Because it is it's enough. Mm. Because if we can be able to address the issues when we are still at the green aspect of the... At the of, base of the know, pyramid. The That's of where the we pyramid. need to be working. Psychiatrists are at the tip. They're at the tip. They're up there. If we, are to, if we could we address have a lot it, of manpower for this. Down here, there are thousands yeah. of them. Yeah. We have, I, I, I was reading the situation analysis, mental health situation analysis 2021, mm. and it was saying that we have over eight, 1,800 psychiatric clinical officers. Yeah. 1,800 psychiatric clinical officers. That was in 2020, 2011. Okay. okay. Producing them since. Then 71. they keep producing mm. them now. The structure, mental, if you address the basic issues, like Barbara said, mm. let the counselor who is down here deal with, early deal with the early distress. So doesn't progress to the a issues that are coming. Mm. So it doesn't have to get to a point where Grace and Odohonya have to do a clinical assessment mm. to come and say, now we need to, you know, do prescribe. this. Prescribe. Yeah. Prescribe and do this. Mm. If we are to be able to do that, we can help. But also, I think. I like uh, it gave us very clear structure over the labor structure that mm. we have. Mm. But if we bring it to mental health in this country, the structures, we have talked about, we have the National Referral Hospital, that is Butavika. Mm. From National Referral Hospital, we have regional referral hospitals. Mm. I think there are about four regional referral hospitals that have psychiatric, well fledged psychiatric units. Yeah. Okay? Mm. From regional, we have districts. District referral hospitals that I still, I know my doctor will confirm. About eight district referral hospitals have fully fledged psychiatric units. Mm. Then, from the district referral hospitals, we now have the sub counties health, center. health centers for going down now. Mm. This service is supposed to go as low as health center three two, two. Mm. but you'll find that we stop at district hospitals. Yeah. That is one. Two, it was just yesterday. I call 2019 as yesterday. Mm. 
that Uganda passed the Uganda Mental Health Act. Yeah. 50 years down the road, mm. they had never either revised it mm. or done anything to it. It was the old, old act that talks about sanity, mm. tying them in chains, imbeciles. isolating mm. them, imbeciles, you get mm. it, mm. until 2019, yesterday that the Mental Health Act came. And the Mental Health Act that was passed came with very beautiful clause in them. Mm -hmm. One of them is what you ask, having a district mental health officer yeah. at the level of a district health officer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. It says that, now that deployment was supposed to take place in the past financial year, yeah. I didn't follow it. I followed it up it to the level happen. where we concluded on the term of reference for their deployment with the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. After that now, they were supposed to be deployed at the last financial year, but are they out there? They are not there, mm. okay? And then people go out there and there's no services. And mm. then we have, I don't want to say government, I put responsibility where it belongs, respective ministries mm. that are supposed to be responsible Which for this. Government? Yeah, mm. you know, nowadays <laughs> when you say government, people run to our party, the NRM party. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's be specific. <laughs> ministries. Yes, ministries, <laughs> okay? Ministries, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, all right. You know, the respective uh, ministries mm. are seated and they're not doing this. And, and then we have strikes coming yeah, on. So yeah. this is really uncalled for. For example, the un very unfortunate event that we woke up to a few days ago mm. when we were talking during the break. Mm. Now, if you look at, that's why I say Uganda has got energy. You know, sometimes I sit on Twitter and, and on social media mm. and I see responses of people and I tell myself, I say, Grace, you have so many patients. Mm. <laughs> you have so many yeah. patients, mm. so many. In my culture, a person who celebrates death mm. is a witch. Mm. Mm. You are a witch if you celebrate death. Yeah. And a person who tries to attach death to a failed system mm. Mm. or to an issue that makes them feel comfortable that we have got an issue to address it, you're equally a witch. Now, when you look at social media that has been going and the circumstances under which they're now saying, I can still attach it to say, unfortunately, a day after we have celebrated the Labor Day, mm. then we lose the state minister mm. in charge of labor. And then so they start so. attaching the cause of his death mm. to, to, to work environment, the, I mean, to lack of payment mm. and, 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 and support of the alleged the issues that are coming. Now, you see this now brings us to our topic, employment. Mm. Mm. And the set of mental health of Ugandans. Mm. Where are we really? And then we have responsible officers, uh, people coming and saying, no, okay, I, I, I've always admired the UPDF and I know they pay. This I can say because I have brothers who are UPDF. Mm. I was paid by military money. At least maybe if it changed now. Mm. But the employment status. We are having bureaucratic environment compared to professionalism. You go to an office and it's about a boss and a junior. Mm. An environment that is mentally very toxic, mm. that is psychologically depressing and violently stimulating. Mm. Because when you create such an environment, you will get the product. And this is not only this is yeah. this is not only with the ministries, even in the different private sectors and where people work. Yeah. Yeah. It's about me letting you know I am your boss mm. and you're my boss. <coughs> no. What I say, you do. When I pass, you salute. Mm. If I want to stay out, I'm not saying they do, mm. but I'm saying if I want to stay out up to 2 a.m., you mm. will stay out up to 2 a.m. Mm. Mm. Drive me to my home, find your way to your home your where home. you are. Whatever happens with you and your wife, I don't care. Tomorrow in the morning at 6, I want you back at my gate because that is your work. Can we really take this month of May, mm. sit back and reflect and say, Empathy. what kind of environment have we created around us mm. as people who work as bosses, as employers and employees? Mm. Actually, if I'm to put that into my own words, I think, or in the words of Henry Barlow mm. in his poem, Building a Nation, mm is you know two different people who are uh, equally performing their roles in building a nation but from different uh, angles mm. one exactly. is uh, the permanent secretary who mm. is driven in the car and mm -hmm. all this then the other is the driver who has to you know do all these uh, drive there, there, there. Mm -hmm. exactly but at the end of the day they all go back home and they they think they're building a nation yeah. yes. but i think in in different ways but mm. uh,
Retired Major, let's speak about priorities and about the health sector. Uganda has money to do many things, and the things that we not even <laughs> mention. But the health, which should be of fundamental importance, which is a common good. And here we are discussing medical interns have not been deployed. We are discussing um, uh, lack of uh, sufficient uh, medical equipment. I don't know. Your priority in terms of health, is it right? Your health is such a fundamental right, and we need it. Although I've uh, often wondered why it is not in Article 44. You know, Article 44. The non derogable rights. The rights that is a no go area, mm -hmm. that you can never, ever tamper with it. Mm -hmm. Rights is not included, though, because those rights include fair hearing. Mm -hmm freedom from slavery, under no circumstance can you say Okello is my slave, mm. freedom to mm. a corpus. if mm. a relative is arrested, he did not mm. say bring that person in this court mm. and mm. Torture. torture, where in the past you would have a magistrate in a court as the jurisdiction to say Okello has been charged of stealing a chicken and this court has found him guilty, give him 20 strokes. Now, not even the courts have that power. Now, amazingly, right to life is not even there. And right to health Hell. is not there. Mm -hmm. It's not among the non-touchable mm -hmm. rights. Because right to life, if somebody commits a capital offense, say murder, mm -hmm. court can convict him to death and he will be hung. We still have death sentence in our penal court. So that by mere fact of having it there, it means therefore right to life is not among the four that cannot be touched. They are untouched by Toji Quarter. Mm. Now, um, health undoubtedly, and without being in Article 44, is still considered a very, very important health. For us in government, in party, in the ruling party, we believe that all said and done, it must crystallize into the livelihood of a citizen. It's a better way of indicator than the GDP is this, the GNI has gone up, the GDP and all that, than the normal theoretical economic figures. So when we said all we do should crystallize to the well-being of a person, mm. it includes his health. How does he eat? How does he sleep? How does he dress? How healthy is he? Now, we have had challenges in the past where uh, we took into this structural adjustment, mm. the World Bank IMF, and amazingly, the first thing they touched was health. Said, liberalize health. Mm. Meaning, state should minimize its tightness on health and set the, legal, the, the health system into mm. private sector. Mm. It has its ups and downs, and pros and cons. And that's why private hospitals emerged all over the place. Mm -hmm. Private pharmacies emerged all over the place. Everything came up. That was part of the structural adjustment program. It mm -hmm. went up to education, reduced mm -hmm. social expenditure on education. Mm -hmm. So, but health was a very, very affected area. And some people thought maybe if we were to swallow the structural adjustment areas, or policies, there are areas that we should have made a no-go, like health areas. But there we are. That was the first challenge that this country came face to face with health into what you call ordinary liberalization. Mm -hmm. We liberalize even health. Mm -hmm. Some people have to now believe that you shouldn't have liberalized on electricity, mm -hmm. shouldn't have liberalized on water. Water still mm -hmm. remains state though, mm -hmm. with national water and sewage still a government parastatal, but electricity we threw it away and else and all that. So it is a challenge. Nevertheless, uh, government tries its best to prioritize it. Because I remember one time we were meeting with somebody as a party sec member, and he, he did not realize that there were doctors who are not employed. Mm. And then he said, you mean, how? Any graduate doctor must be absorbed for now. Mm. You say, but the, Your Excellency, there are doctors who are not employed. You say, how? So I gave that directive. Of course, that would mean a wage bill. 
mm. which government should be ready for. So, priorities in health uh, is a lot of debate and a lot of things that need to be done. Of course, we have always had this uh, the argument that uh, uh, we spend a lot in governance, uh, which includes security. We put in a lot of money. If you see the percentage sharing, defense still takes this. Of course, uh, we would want a same security. Maybe it has brought fruits because if you see, ideally, we are still the only country now peaceful in the area with for all t intent and purposes. And also, maybe that investment, uh, somebody could argue the other way around, but that investment has, has kept us as a country for at least 37 years. Within these 37 years, countries have died. Sudan became two, Libya died, Somali died, Ethiopia broke, uh, 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 this other country was uh, formerly uh, went to World Cup with one country in the middle of quarter, they qualified to quarter final. They, they had become two countries. So now when you go back, where will if you win the cup, where will you take it? So things that you could see value attaching to governance. Mm. But it shouldn't be at the cost of health. We still do believe that much as we strengthen governing, you are not govern, going to govern a sick society. Mm. You must be sure, much as you emphasize governance, you, go, you should govern healthy people. So we, we, we are trying our best to, to put two areas. There are several de declarations and commitment that actually put health investment to a certain percentage as a share of the national uh, budget or national economy. So we have to strive for that and we have to achieve it. Because as I said, we believe in the pattern in government that whatever it is, it must crystallize to the well-being of a person. You're not going to say that person has a good well-being when he's sick, he's lying down, mm. or he's vomiting, mm. or, he has, or his mental health is working but mentally not healthy, mentally sick. Mental health. So, uh, this has been a struggle, but I like to say it's a priority area. And uh, uh, I think slowly, those, uh, I didn't talk, we don't have the data, slowly by slowly, there has been an increase. I need to check the latest data, there has been increase. But it has met the challenge of governing expense at the expense of that. And also, I, uh, as I summarized, I had. I must add that it came, the, the attack was right from structural adjustment policy mm. by World Bank IMF. Mm. But we insist that without narratives, without data, without GPT quote citation and all that, mm. we must stick to the livelihood of a citizen. Mm. Well, thank you. <coughs> well, we have more 20 minutes on this show. And mm. doctor, yeah. uh, could you shed for us uh, a clear picture uh, of the correlation between unemployment and mental health, or employment or underemployment, mm. whatever uh, choice of, uh, of diction. Yeah. The correlation between that mm -hmm. and your mental health. Gladly. Um, but allow because me. Someone can say that those who are employed yeah. are, are more susceptible to to stress, mm. but also not being employed and just being, I, you know, I, I, so. And by the way, doctor, <laughs> I put also my question to you. Recently, I saw on the social media, mm. they, they mentioned various categories of occupation. Mm -hmm. Somebody was looking after cows, he died at one zero nine. <laughs> Another one was looking after chicken, he died at a hundred Then the professor, the professor this, 56. <laughs> A bank manager, <laughs> 49. 49. What is it? Is it true? <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to address both questions, but I think that uh, my mother association, Uganda Medical Association, would not forgive me <laughs> if I sat on a panel <laughs> and the people that commented on our interns was everybody but Dr. Dokonya. Mm. So allow me just a minute to say mm. we are in a very unfortunate and also rather precarious situation right now. Mm. Uh, for your information, it's not only the medical interns who are on strike. We also have our specialist trainees, doctors, the ones we call senior house officers, who have been on strike since May 1, since Labor Day. 
um, these are doctors these who are, are going for an extra, mm -hmm. like a doctor specializing in gynecology. Yes. But he's still in school. Yes. Mm. So they're in school right now, but they are working mm. as medical doctors. Now, what is happening is, uh, I, I think for me, I would like to agree with Major here that when it comes to the really top management of this country, the feelings toward health are known. I think the president is really somebody who appreciates health. And if COVID-19 was anything to go by, you could see the, you know, how much effort he put in, how much he wanted to understand things from a scientific point of view and to address them uh, by the right people. Also what Major said is that when you liberalize the health sector and allow all sorts of players in, private players, alongside the public players, but as well as extend that to education, where you liberalize education and we move from two <coughs> medical schools in my time of training to now maybe about 17 medical schools, <laughs> anywhere between 13 to 17 well, medical schools. Hmm. That, that's a huge jump. And all these schools are churning out doctors. When I went to medical school, Makere was capped at 90 students per year intake. So from year one to year five would be less than 500. Mbara was capped at 30. So every year, if we passed, you had 120 mm. qualified doctors okay, who would then get into the internship That's space. Today, Makere has doubled that number. We now have more than 200 students per intake. Wow. KIU brought in a very different ball game mm. where you have 300 students. Mbara is probably around 100. So we are releasing so many doctors in the thousands for medical interns now. People who are ready to get into the job market. So that's where the problems start. While we liberalize education sector and health sector, mm. we didn't accompany it with the right planning. Because we knew we wanted more doctors. The president has always wanted more doctors. But we didn't plan for 50,000 doctors being released. Mm -hmm. We've always planned for 6,000 doctors who are registered in this country. And if you look at our registers, you'll already see 6,000. But we are way more than that. So yes, there are doctors who are unemployed. Leaving that aside, I think the real problem that I see here is two. One is that the communication is completely broken. Mm -hmm. I think that all these strikes could have been avoided mm -hmm. by just communicating right. Mm -hmm. When one party is trying to communicate and the other one is quiet, the one talking feels aggrieved, feels disrespected, feels ignored. And that's kind of what has been happening. The young lads were talking to the ministry and the ministry wasn't responding, wasn't talking back. Mm. The second issue is that if the talking then starts, I think that we need to go back to the drawing board and start to actually plan and not plan for today or tomorrow. We need to plan. This country's population will be 100 million in a very short time. Yeah. And you will need doctors. The general public needs to understand that an intern doctor is a medical doctor, qualified medical doctor. Yes. He's not a student. No. Mm -hmm. There are other forms of internship out there which we are confusing for medical internship. Mm -hmm. The medical intern is a qualified medical doctor Graduate and in a health facility carries nearly 80 percent of the load manages emergencies is the one who does the preparation for theater decides who gets on the theater list is the one who you know attends the outpatients is the one who should be called first is the first line of response so that's a very important cut of health work there 
we shouldn't let pride get in the way to stop us from getting them deployed. Whatever the case, we need an arrangement that gets these doctors deployed. So that's as much as I want to say, and I'd like to let you guys know that for us as professional associations, we really stand with the junior, we call them junior house officers, mm -hmm. and their senior house officers. And I'm saying that if that is not managed now, then you risk getting medical officers special grade who are above the senior house officers mm -hmm. getting into Doing this mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because now they have to do the work of an intern, and yet that's a specialist. Because that's what it means. If we don't have interns, somebody's got to go and You're run going that. To clerk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and look for lines. Yeah. Going to set clerk yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. But back to your, your question, and thank you for letting me just mm. add my voice to that. Um, back to your question employment and mental health are bedmates. It's like two sides of the same coin. So we are talking about determinants of mental health here. One of the well-recognized determinants of mental health is poverty. It is documented in all sorts of ways. If you should be poor, you cannot for one second claim that you're mentally healthy. Now, some people say, hmm, uh, what about the people in the village? And I like to tell you, Ghana. Yeah, that's what I'm about to ask you. How do you determine who is poor? Yes. What is the definition of a poor exactly. person? Exactly. And the definition that you guys are using is totally wrong. Which one am I using? The one for World Bank. Mm. World mm. Bank has no idea what a, a poor African is or a rich African. One meal a day? In fact, those one, of us one dollar a day. One dollar a day. We are the mm. real poor Ugandans. The people in my village who can keep 5,000 on them because they have no need, no it. use it for it, it yes. for months. Because he can pick food from here and there. He has milk from his goats and cows. He has chicken all over the place. Green is eating a real balanced diet. Right. Mm -hmm. In Kampala, we eat four or five foods for the rest of the year. Every day for a year. Mm -hmm. Who are the real poor people here? <laughs> Okay, so poverty by the definition that you cannot afford your basic needs is what we are talking about here. Because if you can't afford basic needs, you can't afford health care, you can't afford to eat, you can't afford decent shelter, then you get distressed. Those are determinants of health. That means you can't even keep your environment clean. Those are determinants of health. Not just mental health, but health in general. That's where disease proliferates. That's where crime proliferates. That's where corruption proliferates. Now, if we cannot manage that, then we are saying that employment and unemployment become a real vehicle to carry mental illness around. Because in an unemployed, and you can look at their case studies on you know, um, unemployed youth in this country. Mm. Youths dwelling in slums. That's where you'll have the highest rates of substance abuse, mm -hmm. uh, violence, and you know things like that. You have a lot of mood disorders because of the other determinants we are saying. They have all sorts of mental health burdens. In any country where there is poverty, look at Sub-Saharan Africa. I think Major here was talking about Sweden and, and Switzerland. Of the global burden of mental illness, 80% of it is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And what is unique about Sub-Saharan Africa? Poverty. Poverty by that definition. So employment is a very important vehicle to fight mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes a protective factor. And we need more of those protective factors. Not only should you get employed, <coughs> but you should also be paid well and on time. Because you could keep me employed, but you don't remunerate me well. And it comes after six months. How do I survive? How do I eat? 
So that links for you employment, whatever the status, whether employed or unemployed mm -hmm. to our mental health. Are there any merits to people who do blue collar jobs, living longer, having better mental health? I saw the, 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 the skit that you, you're referring to. And although I think for me, when something gets on social media like that, uh, people who are on social media want to live by one line. They want to read the one line that will make sense. To them. Will make their life, you know, have all the sense. Uh, certainly that is too little for us to go by. It's, uh, you know, a few cases. Someone else can bring you cases of uh, the late Odongas who are professors who lived for, you know, many years, 99, 97. Um, and again, depends on the argument you want to swing. But generally speaking, I think that the more your environment supports mental health, the better for exactly. your longevity. Mm -hmm. So as a farmer, I would like to imagine what are, kind, what are the kind of stressors of a farmer? What are kind of the risk factors? Lately now we are starting to see cancers proliferate among them because of um, all the chemicals that farmers are using now. But before <coughs> that, when it was all organic, <coughs> you're living in a really non stimulating environment mm -hmm. like that, I think it is, it makes sense that you should live longer. Mm -hmm. It also makes sense that if you have social support, which is another social determinant of <coughs> mental health, that if you have many wives and many children, you should live longer. Mm -hmm. That is social support. People are getting mentally ill because they lack. Is that support. right? They have no <laughs> girlfriends, they have no spouses. Mm -hmm. is that and I, and I don't see that there's a problem with having many wives. For that. I think that for me, mm -hmm. that was Africa's way of stopping, stopping divorce. Today, divorce is one of the determinants of mental ill health. Yes. <laughs> because we have one, and once you cannot handle this one anymore, you break down. it makes sense that you should leave them, or they should leave you. So and then the public is saying, don't leave. Stay there. stay there, suffer. In, including the church. <laughs> including the church. They're yeah. saying you stay there and suffer. Or even the court. Sometimes. Yes, sometimes the court also refuses to support you to, mm. to leave this unhealthy relationship. Mm. So I, I, I think that it's multifaceted mm. and we could argue it many different ways. Yeah. But for sure there is a link mm. between employment and mental health. And well, just, mm. just, just a, a, a quick, like you talked about uh, the environment. I want to say like, for example... Uh, uh, have we thought about the stress you get when looking for a job? Mm. You know you apply, you, you feel you you're so mm. good, you're mm. so qualified, and you've applied and you're sure you're going to get it. You're not even solicited for an interview. <laughs> that is so stressful yeah. that you get for looking it for is. a job. And then the stress that those employed have, mm. maintaining the high targets. Juggling the traffic to get to office. Mm. Dealing with this boss who is unqualified. <laughs> and they're there, boss, mm. and you, you have to be there to manage them. So there's so much, I like his word that mental health and, and, and employment are mm. at the same bed. Mm. There's so much mm. that employment contributes towards mm. mental health. Mm. Equally, and mental health wrong. contributes mm. towards employment, mm. okay? If you have a staff that is disgruntled, their productivity will be low. Their interpersonal skills will be low. Mm their communication will be poor, mm. Mm. you know, so it will affect everything around them. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I know you've not asked, but I wanted to bring this now. We are, we, we, we are having uh, May, the Mental Health Awareness Month, mm. and from last year, as Uganda, mm. as Ugandans, practitioners, professionals in the mental health field, and, and partners and CSOs, we said, okay, every year, globally, May is taken as a, a, a month to raise awareness. People mm. share Correct information around mental health. Mm -hmm. What can we do as a country? So we said every year we'll be crowning up this month mm -hmm. with a learning session, okay? And we create an environment where people come, practitioners, implementers, policymakers, mm -hmm. you know, government, states, they come and yeah. we sit together and we, and, and we learn what mm -hmm. from each other and share what has happened. And last year we had a very successful mm -hmm. first Uganda National Mental Health Conference. 
that happened. This year we are having the next one coming up, mm. this very same May. It's a talk that we are also putting with the awareness raising. Mm -hmm. And I brought it up because I love the theme. It touches alongside employment. Yeah. The theme for this year, we are saying we are prioritizing mental health through community involvement. Mm -hmm. And we are saying mental health for all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The person in the community there, the, the, the unemployed, the undeployed intern doctors, mm -hmm. you know, the, we, we want them to be involved, to see that as we speak, when we speak about mental health, we want everybody down there to understand that mental health is about their health. The, about me, before I start thinking about Kidega, before I start pointing fingers at Draymond, it's about me first. And how do I get involved? And how can I take care of myself? And then when we are able to address that, then we are addressing mental health for all. And this conference is coming up in May. This, this May, 24th to 26th. Uh, at Silver Springs Hotel. And we are having all these mental health practitioners all over the country, from the country, they will be there. We have even gone regional, the East, the East African region. We are mm -hmm. having colleagues coming over mm -hmm. from Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda joining in mm -hmm. to be part. And we are having government ministries joining. We are having all the professional bodies. That's why you see Uganda Psychiatric Association is here. Uganda mm -hmm. Counseling Association is here. The civil society, the implementing partners and operating partners in Uganda mm. in 2019 sat down and said there's a lot of gaps. Communication, mm. supervision, very no, no platform for learning. And they decided to come together and form a platform for coordination mm. and advocacy. Mm. And this platform, these people have advocated and pushed a lot. Mm. Partly, even for the signing of the Mental Health Act mm. in 2019, mm. I attribute it to this team. Mm. So they form a group that they call the Uganda Mental, National Mental Health Working Group. Mm. And this working group brings all the implementing operating partners, both from private and government. Mm. And they, we, we meet every month. Mm. Mm. Last Tuesday of the month, discuss, share knowledge, share issues, what is happening in the country. Mm. And I can say it with every boldness that... The people who are addressing the mental health needs of this country, the 15% that the health committee report brought, are the private sector. Are uh, these partners here who have now formed this working group? So uh, this working group, the national working group, where I'm the national coordinator, mm. and the Uganda Psychiatric Association and Uganda Counseling Association have come together with Minister of Health Division of Mental Health. And every year we'll be having a national mental health conference mm -hmm. every year to crown May. And I would like to interest our senior citizen mm -hmm. that we, we can provide a lot and contribute very highly to the achievement of the manifesto of the NRM as a party if they choose to be intentional mm -hmm. to start addressing the mental health issues of Ugandans. I like what you say that to the president, it's about what does the common person out there gain. That is what matters. But is that what we are getting? That is not what we are getting. And there's something that we can do to get there. Thank Very you. right. Well, we have only four minutes to be out of this place, but I'll give you each mm -hmm. a minute just to give us your last words on the show. I'm giving you right retired major as I come towards Chris. Well, just to say thank you for the discussion. It is so professional, so frank. And I just like to assure that we shall carry the debate on, the conversation on. There's no hidden agenda about it. And to my colleague there, better visit me and we talk and actually see mainstream the mani manifesto or manif mainstream your activities. I know it falls in various sectors, but we could see how we can interface and even push government branches which are supposed to to act with you because we are there with the party. You can see which government branch you feel you should deal with mm -hmm. and it's not coming forth quickly. Shall say, hey, come on, go and join them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, nice to meet this team. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, bro. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and to all of viewers. Please take care of yourself, take care of your mental health, take care of your environment and prioritize you because there is no one like you. Wow. Yes, Doctor. Yeah, let me join my colleagues in appreciating you for holding this very high caliber panel. Mental health is a living subject. It's everyday things we go through. And anybody 
can help somebody who is in distress. I would like to encourage viewers this month of May to look out for opportunities to learn from uh, you know, the different platforms where we are sharing information, but also to come forth and ask us questions. We are happy to engage with and to educate you mm -hmm. in this month of May. Mm -hmm. We thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yes, bless. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I really would like to appreciate uh, Civic Space. You have always provided for us space to discuss issues around mental health mm -hmm. last year. This, uh, during May, we were the same, discussing mm -hmm. the same, and again, we are here. So thank you very much for giving time for us to discuss this. Mm -hmm. And to the viewers, thank you very much for taking time, being part of this, to learn with us. And uh, like my colleague said, I want to join them and also invite all of us. Let's take care of ourselves. It mm -hmm. starts with me mm -hmm. before it gets to you. And uh, let also be our neighbor's keepers. Yes. Let us not shut off and say, no, I, I, it doesn't concern me. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, let Ugandans let us become sensitive with what we post on social media. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of trauma that we are giving to fellow Ugandans by what we post on social media, sharing bad content, sharing, writing, attacking words, writing, mm -hmm. all those uh, causes that <coughs> leads to it. it puts people into an emotional state that mm. we define as a mental health heal. So mm. let us be each other's watch and let us be mindful of what we share on social media. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Retired Major, I can't thank you enough. Barbara, thank you very much. Doctor, thank you. And Grace, thank you for spending the time to be on this week's episode of the Citizens Chat Show. Well, my last words to you, our viewers, are perhaps the words of uh, Jeff Kennedy, who said that, before you ask what the country is doing for you, ask yourself what you can do for the country. Mm -hmm. So be, before you ask what has, the, what has Uganda done about your mental health, mm -hmm. what are you doing about your own mental health? It starts okay. with you. Well, thank you for joining us. See you next <coughs> week, same time, same place. Bye-bye.